Okay, it is recording and it looks like it's nine o'clock. So whenever you are ready, um, we can begin. Great. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our April Swetland Center seminar series. For those of you that are new to the Swetland Center, we are an academic research center in the School of Medicine at Case Western. And our mission is to study the complex interplay between the environment and human health with a focus on translating those findings into policies and practices to promote environmental health equity. Today, I want to take a moment to welcome our, a new staff member, uh, Lindsay, who you've already engaged with to some extent, um, because she was supporting all of the develop or the registrations for the seminar for today. Um, Lindsay is our new training lead within the Sweatland Center. Um, just a little bit of background. She grew up on Cleveland's east side and completed her undergraduate degree at Ohio State University. From there, she worked as a medical laboratory scientist at the Cleveland Clinic. Yet, as we know, in the public health field, sometimes you get pulled to grow in new ways. Um, and so Lindsay, while still working at the clinic, earned dual degrees, dual master's degrees in public health and nutrition at Case Western with the focus on health promotion and disease prevention. She joined our team earlier this year as program manager for the building capacity for obesity prevention study, and also as the training lead. She's going to be your go-to person for our um, upcoming seminar series. And I know, Lindsay, you did have a quick slide before we introduce our speaker, just about um, kind of the way that will work on the seminar. Do you wanna go over that? Sure, thank you so much for the introduction, Darcy. I am so happy to be here and thank you all for joining us. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of housekeeping items before we begin. So as you may notice, um, you are all muted. So if you would like to communicate, please do so using the chat box feature. If you have a question, feel free to use the Q&A feature or you can use the raise hand feature. And um, I'm sure we'll have time for questions at the end of the presentation. We'd be more than happy to address those. Um, so those were some housekeeping items. And you may notice that this presentation is being recorded. So we will post the recording on our Sweatland Center website. If you would like to view the presentation at a later time, or if you know anybody who was interested in watching the presentation that will be available to you. And I also just wanted to make note of our upcoming seminar that we have. So our May seminar is going to be held on May 25th at 9 a.m. And it is uh, titled Pipeline to Practice and Covering the Pathways to a Career in Environmental Health. So we have four presenters for that seminar. They are current and former trainees of the Sweatland Center, and they will be touching upon their experiences as environmental health trainees, some of their experiences in their current career um, positions, as well as their future career goals. And this will just be a sort of discussion panel type seminar. So please um, join us for that if you would like. And I will pop the registration link for that seminar in the chat box here. Okay. Thank you, Lindsay. And I see a lot of people are starting to type in their name and affiliation in the chat box. So please continue to do that. So you can see we have, uh, of course, Elizabeth has drawn in some folks from across the state and from Ohio State University. So it's fun to have some new folks on the call today. Um, I am delighted to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Root. Um, she is a professor with a joint appointment in the Department of Geography and Division of Epidemiology at Ohio State University. She's also faculty affiliate of the Translational Data Analytics Institute and serves on the leadership team for the Institute for Population Research. Dr. Root is a health geographer with a focus on social determinants of health in evaluating place-based health interventions using geospatial analysis, GIS, and large administrative data sources. She has active research projects in the US, Honduras, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and the Philippines through 
um, her funded work with the NIH, NSF, USAID, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Today, Dr. Root will be speaking to us about social determinants and the opioid epidemic in Ohio and sharing research conducted as a part of the Healing Community Study. Many of you know uh, that the Swetland Center is engaged in this study. Sarah uh, Roberts is a program manager working with a, a number of counties across the state. I'm involved in the Community Engagement Corps. Millie's involved in the um, Community Engagement Corps with the research. But I want to just offer a special thanks to Elizabeth because through that study, um, it is a it's a whirlwind of a study, and it just goes to show how much our worlds can collide and our um, experiences. Just spending a lot of time together on a study and working through problems together. So I've just really appreciated Elizabeth's focus on how do we bring data into the story of these really complex problems and not let data be the guide of, you know, be the, the end all be all. Um, and that, you know, rather what is the problem we're addressing and then how do we bring data to bear? Even if it means we have to question some of our approaches with data. Um, so I've just really appreciated that about Elizabeth's approach to uh, particular her engagement with the healing community study. So with that, Elizabeth, we'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Darcy. What a nice introduction. I'm going to share my screen um, and assume that I can do it well. All right. I'm assuming everybody can see my screen OK. Yep. Great. OK, so thank you. That was a very nice introduction. Um, I, I, and I appreciate it because that is one of the things that I feel very strongly about data is that it's a very useful tool, but only if you've asked the right questions and you've engaged the community first around how data can be useful. And so it's sort of one of my mantras and I feel like I've actually had the opportunity to walk the walk and talk the talk with the healing community study, even though it is a very large and complex study. Um, so what I thought I'd do today is talk a bit about um, um, sort of trying to keep the social determinants of health at the forefront of many of the research questions that we're looking at with the healing community study. So I'm just going to do a really brief social determinants of health, um, in particular the way sort of I see it, um, and then look take a broader look at how um, substance use disorders and, and the, the SUD literature has looked at the social determinants of health. It's a rather nascent um, area in, sub, in SUD research, I think. Um, give just a really quick three slide overview of the healing community study, and then actually bring the two together and try to talk about how and why understanding community level social determinants of health are so important for the healing community study, as well as other community based intervention programs. Um, and then just share a little bit of the work we've done on substance, um, on the social determinants of health of OUD. And most of that work actually had been done prior to the healing community study. So it's not actually necessarily part of the study. It sort of has stimulated a lot of the framing of um, some of the questions we're asking with the healing community study da data though. So um, I'm a geographer as uh, Darcy said. And so one of the ways that I view health um, is sort of looking at the intersection of health, place, and equity. So we have this concept called the social determinants of health, um, and we know that the community level factors that exist within community, you know, all these factors that exist within communities are really important and responsible for a significant amount of the health inequities that we see both within communities and also across communities. So it's responsible for both within and across community heterogeneity and health outcomes. And there's, um, there's a lot of them, right? I just put a few up here, right? We've got health facilities and schools and childcare and whether or not your community is safe um, or whether or not you're exposed to high levels of violence and crime. So there's a tremendous amount of um, heterogeneity across communities and all these different factors. And in reality, they all sort of capture that there's inequalities in our environment that therefore leads to inequalities in health. And because I'm a geographer, what I typically then see is we call them geospatial inequalities in health. So because place is so important and communities have all of these aspects to them, 
What that means then is that we see spatial inequality. So when we look at our communities, when we look across our state, we see different patterns and health outcomes. Um, but a lot of that can be attributed to the differences in place. Um, and place matters because you basically, we, you know, you can think of communities as, I don't like to use the word de deprived, although that's what's been used in the social determinants of health literature as deprivation indices or this concept of deprived. I'd like to frame it more in terms of communities of opportunity and high vulnerability communities. So, you know, if you think about a place that you know, whatever that is, a neighborhood in Cleveland, a neighborhood in Columbus, you can, you can frame it in terms of all the things that exist within that community, right? Um, in, a high in a high vulnerability community, you might see lots of fast food restaurants and liquor stores. Um, you might see unsafe or limited, um, or limited access to parks and green space. You might have poorer performing schools. Um, and you must, might also have things like increased pollution and toxic waste sites, which might cause in, um, um, in e unequal um, exposure to um, different um, pollutants in the environment. So on the opposite side, you might see a community that has a lot of opportunity. There's great parks and they're safe and kids can go to them without being monitored, free range children, all of that. Um, you have good grocery stores, you have financial institutions that can support people um, and better performing schools. And the issue is, is that the poor, poor health status um, that you might find in some of these high vulnerable communities because of the structures that don't or exist in the communities um, contribute to lots of different health disparities. There's a tremendous amount of literature that shows community level effects in obesity and diabetes and asthma, infant mortality, preterm birth, whereas these communities of opportunity lead to good health status, right? So the, the issue is, is that, you know, place really matters, right? Um, so turning a little bit to the substance use disorder literature, um, when I, I have to admit, I was not a substance use researcher um, prior to starting the healing community study. I'd done a little bit of work on, um, on alcohol, but not a lot in opioid space or substance abuse in general. And when I turned to the literature to try to see sort of what is this literature telling me about community level social determinants of health, I was actually surprised at how little there was there. Um, so if you think of the social determinants of health, this is a really common framework that's often used to think about the social determinants. It's the Dahlgren and Whitehead. Um, and it, it basically, it's the rainbow. But really what it's saying is that there's sort of nested, um, there's sort of a nested hierarchy of different factors which impact health. So we've got age and sex and hereditary factors. You have your individual lifestyle choices. There's social and community structures and networks that support that. The little one, the, the next level right there that has agriculture, education, work environment, these are the things that are more about your community, right? So this is sort of what I was focusing on earlier, um, the, the sort of community level factors. And Dahlgren and Whitehead talk about them as proximal versus distal, but they're also individual versus community. So we can think of the social determinants of being proximal or more specific to the individual versus distal or more specific to a community. And generally what I found as I sort of cased the SUD OUD literature was that it really focuses on proximal determinants. So it looks at demographic and individual lifestyle um, and, and behaviors and choices that are made. It also, um, there is a, a pretty deep focus on the social and community networks. So there's a lot of literature out there on peer support and stigma and exposure to prevention programs. Um, so those are fairly well represented in the substance use disorder literature. But when I kept digging a little bit further, there's only a very small SUD literature that focuses on these true distal community level living and working conditions and how those impact substance use disorders and opioid use disorder in particular. The literature around opioid use disorders is even smaller. Um, and some that even like, I think I found a, a handful of studies that really focused on political structures or larger economic and structural components of the community that are barriers or facilitators to um, either SUD treatment or the development of a substance use disorder. And so I was kind of surprised, um, but that presented this huge opportunity to the healing community study to really sort of dig into how these community level factors might affect opioid use disorders, partially because the healing community study, as you'll see in a minute, is pretty big and it incorporates four different states. 
that have four very different community structures, right, across the different communities that have been included in the study. So the social determinants of health, though, are, are really complex, and they're very interrelated to one another. So the social determinants of health is what I would call a geographic and multidimensional concept. Geographic because we are talking about community level factors that impact health. And that by its very nature requires us to understand and to measure place or a geography. It's multidimensional because there's not one variable, there is not one aspect of community that fully encompasses the social determinants of health. The literature is tried, right? We have poverty is used all the time as a measure of sort of community level socioeconomic status or median household income or something like that, or perhaps a couple of variables, education level and poverty. But in reality, the social determinants of health are much, much more complicated than that. Um, and so there's these multitude of factors that exist and impact people's lives daily. These factors also interact in space and time. So it may be that it's sort of an interaction between poverty and poor housing. That's, that, that's really a dominant social determinant of health in a specific area. Um, and so this begs this need for small area estimates to capture these differences between very complex neighborhood environments. So this creates a real challenge for empirical measurement for the social determinants of health. One variable can't capture this complex construct. And so the question is, how do you do? So what we've done or what I've done in, in, um, in collaboration with the Ohio Department of Medicaid and the Ohio Department of Health is we've developed an index which actually combines multiple measures of these community level social determinants into sort of a larger construct that we can use to look at variation across communities in Ohio. So we've called this the Ohio Opportunity Index. And this is version 1.0 of it. We're actually, um, actually no, this is version 2.0 because it has the environment in it. There was an original version 1.0 that didn't include environment, um, partially because it was um, it was hard to get, it was hard to create the data at the time, um, but we have now fixed that problem. So the Ohio Opportunity Index is actually based off of work that's been done in the UK and in Scotland and in New Zealand for several decades. Um, so those countries, because they had nationalized health systems, they had a very central way of collecting small area estimate data on a lot of these factors that you see here. Um, so this is not exactly the same because there are different determinants that, that are more important um, in the United States than they are in other contexts. But just so you know, this is based off of a lot of work that was done by colleagues of mine across in, in other countries um, to sort of look at how to construct an index and how to measure things. So you can see that the Ohio Opportunity Index has um, seven domains, um, and they're sort of that's what the top is: transportation, education, employment, housing, health, environment, and crime. These domains were selected using sort of stakeholder interviews about what is an important social determinant of health, how do we measure that in communities, as well as a very deep review of the literature. So this comes from multiple different sources. The next step that we took was, okay, transportation. Everybody agrees that transportation opportunity is really important for a community. So given that, how do we measure transportation, right? Because that could be measured multiple different ways. And in fact, there's multiple aspects of transportation that you might wanna capture. And so that led to even additional literature searching um, as well as some additional interviewing um, across the state. And um, that came that we came up with this sort of subset of variables that were um, that we could use. Um, there were other considerations too, of course. We had to be able to get small area estimates, and for us, that meant at the census tract level. Um, we also needed to be able to have a temporal. Um, it, it needed to temporally match up with all the other variables. So we had a space and a time consideration in selecting the variables and then constructing the index. Um, the backbone of of the any any index is actually census data. So you'll notice that many of the variables in here are actually census data. So um, the unemployment rate, poverty, median rent, median home value, these things do come from the American Community Survey. That's one of the reasons this is at the census tract rather than the census block group, because the American Community Survey data is got a lot of problems 
because of the small sample size at the census block level. And so going up one geography to the census tract allowed us to have more confidence in the stability of a lot of the variables that are in um, the American Community Survey. They have smaller standard errors and all of that. So that's one of the reasons we selected the tract. We then matched the timing of all the other variables, like the average school performance and average free and reduced lunch rate, which actually came from the Ohio Department of Education, um, matched the timing or the temporal component or the years of the data to the end of the ACS. So we had, we had a lot of considerations in juggling all of these things. Um, we partnered with lots of agencies around the state. So yes, we had census data, but we needed to pull information from the Ohio Department of Education um, the Department of Public Safety provided crime data. Um, the uh, Medicaid and the Ohio Department of Health uh, provided most of the data that you see in the health, um, in this health realm right here. So this was a pretty major undertaking that required collaboration across um, lots of agencies across the state. So the way the Ohio Opportunity Index is, is we have all of these variables. Um, they all have slightly different ways of measuring them, and so we create z-scores out of each of them so that we normalize them to some scale, um, some specific scale, a z-score scale. And then what we do is we basically add them up within this realm, um, and we have a transportation score, and it's a combination of the four variables that you see there. So we have a transpor transportation domain index. We have an education domain index. We have an employment domain index. So each of the components of the Ohio Opportunity Index can actually be used separately if you just wanted to look at transportation opportunity on a health outcome. But then we've also created a methodology whereby all of these domains are then summed up essentially to create the overhaul opportunity index. And so there's one measure that we call the opportunity index, which includes all of these domains um, and then there's domain scores. And you'll see what I mean when, um, when I show you some of the results we've done. So that's the Ohio Opportunity Index, which we're relying on pretty heavily for a lot of our social determinants work in the healing community study. So healing community study. Um, here is the, these are the, um, sorry, these are the study sites that we've selected. Um, they were selected to represent Appalachia and non-Appalachia. They were representative of rural and urban in Ohio. And they're also, um, you can see that they're geographically randomized as well, because we didn't want, we, we basically were trying to minimize spillover effect of these community-based inter interventions. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure that we weren't getting clusters of counties when we selected our sample. The point of the healing community study, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, is that it's it's um, it, it's an intervention that tests the impact of an integrated set of evidence-based practices across a lot of different settings. The primary study outcome is to reduce opioid-related overdose deaths by 40% over the course of three years. So these evidence-based practices that are implemented in the communities are um, are expected to have a pretty uh, impact, pretty high impact on reducing opioid-related overdose. Okay. So that being said, what is this integrated set of evidence-based practices? So HCS is unique because the purpose is not to evaluate the evidence-based programs. Those evidence-based programs are evidence-based. They've already been evaluated. We know that they are impactful if they are implemented correctly in reducing all sorts of opioid-related um, outcomes. The point of HCS was really to support community decision-making around the selection and implementation of those evidence-based practices. And in that way, it is a community-based intervention because what we are doing in the HCS communities is we're building capacity. So we are engaging with the communities to identify um, the, the resources that they need to implement these practices, um, the, net, the ties and the um, sort of the social ties and uh, sort of community support that they need to implement these, these particular evidence-based practices. Um, and then we're, we're helping them make those decisions. Um, so that they're selecting the evidence-based programs that they feel will be most impactful and that they will be able to implement in their community. The evaluation then is, is, is very large. As Darcy stated, it's kind of a whirlwind. We're evaluating basically the community's ab um, ability to work together and implement some of those practices. 
but we're also evaluating the outcomes, right? So we are trying to see if the, if the evidence-based programs have had the intended impact, but we're also deep, you know, studying how the community is working together to implement those different practices. So the goal of HDS is really to see what sorts of community-engaged processes are most effective and efficient at reducing opioid deaths, not whether or not an evidence-based program works, but what community-engaged processes are most effective. So that being said, um, our HCS communities are extraordinarily diverse. So this is me just pulling a few little things for the, the, the um, communities that we've selected for the Healing Community Study. Again, it's across the rural and urban continuum. Poverty ranges from 7 to 30% in our communities. The percent of African Americans ranges from 0.8 to 31% in our communities. So all of our communities are highly diverse. And this is just Ohio. If you compare Ohio to Massachusetts or New York, who are two of the other sites in the study, you'll see there's even additional diversity that's, in, that's sort of added to this, um, to this study. So what does that mean um, for the social determinants of health? So here's me bringing it all back together. HCS is a community-based intervention, right? The point of HCS is to evaluate how communities um, work together to implement EBPs and how that translates into success in terms of reducing opioid outcomes. But given that there's so much heterogeneity across the communities and all of the distal factors that impact substance use disorder, um, healthcare infrastructure, social and economic opportunity, community recovery capital, which is essentially all of the um, substance use disorder um, um, structures that either support MOUD, um, medication for opioid use disorder, or um, peer support or whatever. Um, stigma differs across our communities. There's also differences in policies and laws around uh, drug courts or policing and all these other things. So what that means is that HCS, we can't possibly evaluate the success or the impact of HCS without incorporating the social determinants of health to understand those intervention impacts. Like it's in my mind as a social determinants of health researcher to leave out the social determinants of health in trying to understand the impact of the intervention in the community. I just don't know how you do it, right? It seems like a lost cause to me. So I've been advocating very strongly that the social determinants of health need to be up like at the forefront of our evaluation so that we can understand how the heterogeneity across communities might impact a community-based intervention. So that's my, that's my spiel on why social determinants are healthy are, are important for community-based interventions. So what I wanna do with the rest of my time is share a little bit of the OUD social determinants of health work we've done in Ohio and think about this in terms of why the social determinants are important when we evaluate community-based interventions. Um, so there's a lot of area level factors that guide program and policy investment. Um, and so it's, these are some of the things that, um, you know, I explore as well as using the Ohio Opportunity Index and a, and a bunch of other things. So um, I was on a, I was working on a project and I think Darcy was a bit involved in this one as well, where we were asked to essentially map out the factors that drive or impact different endpoints that are related to opioid use disorder. So here's an example of looking at um, MOUD treatment retention. So retaining, once somebody has started medication for opioid use disorder, um, we want to retain them for six months or longer. That's standard best practice right now. So how do you understand all of the factors that impact something like retention, right? I mean, first you have to get somebody initiated in MOUD, so it's sort of an intermediate endpoint. But when you look, think about treatment, there are so many things that drive retention or even initiation in MOUD. So of course we have, you know, sort of simple things like age and sex and education, um, whether or not somebody has um, um, a primary care provider whether or not they um, have been involved in criminal or, cryo, or child protective services or drug court involvement, that will of course impact whether or not somebody um, initiates MOUD. Um, but then there's also things like public transportation availability, right? 
um, whether or not there are providers who actually prescribe buprenorphine or some other form of MOUD that available in the community, um, whether or not somebody has a job, right, um, or whether or not there's jobs generally available in the community. All of these sorts of things at the community level can impact um, whether or not somebody initiates or is retained on MUD. And so this is sort of the framework we started with when we started thinking about not just the individual level social determinants, and, um, but also the area level or contextual social determinants of MOUD. So I'm a geographer again, I'll put that out there, because a lot of the research questions that I ask are related to geographic variation. So one of the first things that we started looking at was whether or not there's geographic variation in opioid use disorder um, and other study measures, right? So is there even a geographic disparity or geographic variation? If there is, these spatial inequalities are often indicative of area or community level social determinants um, of health that impact some of these outcomes. So when you see spatial inequalities in outcome, it typically means that there's area or community level um, inequalities that are sort of impacting that or driving that. Um, and then the second question is, can we sort of get a, a, a high level glimpse of what area level social determinants seem to drive that geographic variation or the differences that we see across the study area? So I'm going to kind of look at this in a couple of different ways. Um, I use, as Darcy said, a lot of spatial techniques. So I do a lot of mapping. I do a lot of sort of spatial analysis, and I do, um, I still do a lot of regression based um, analysis. I just tend to use spatial models for this. So, what I'm going to show you today sort of centers around three different things. We did a lot of small area rate mapping. Um, and small area rate mapping for rare, rare things, because opioid use disorder is still fairly, considered a fairly rare event, um, it's challenging because rates are very unstable. Um, when you have denominators that range from a very, very small number in one census tract to a really large number in another census tract, when you, you know, add an event to the numerator, you can get these rates that sort of swing really wildly. Um, and so um, we, we say that these rate maps are unstable. And sometimes the maps can be really misleading because they're based off of very small numbers when you're doing small area rates. So one of the techniques that we use is called spatial smoothing. Um, and spatial smoothing actually helps us reduce um, random noise in these rate maps, these really peaky numbers that you see. And it does that um, similar to the way a time series, or um, I'm sorry, doing like a three year um, rate kind of stabilizes smaller numbers by just adding or aggregating additional time um, steps in. Um, spatial smoothing does the same thing. It sort of borrows strength from the data in surrounding areas to stabilize a rate in, in a focal area. So it sort of smooths out the data um, and takes care of some of those small numbers issues. The other thing that we I typically then do is look at um, spatial clusters. And this is a statistical technique that sort of looks at a study area and says, where are rates or where are events higher than we would expect given the distribution of cases across the state and the population across the state? So it identifies basically hotspots or clusters of particular outcomes um, that's not related necessarily to the underlying population distribution, right? So this is one technique that I'll show you in our sort of search for these spatial inequalities. The other thing is, I, is, is sort of some form of a spatial regression model. And this is where we bring back in the Ohio Opportunity Index. So we did a lot of uh, what I would call ecological modeling. So we're not using individual level outcomes. We're looking at what the rate is in a particular area, right? So the rate of opioid use disorder in a census tract or the rate of MOUD treatment in a census tract. Um, and, we, and we then associate that with a ton of different area level factors. And in particular, I'm gonna show you the Ohio Opportunity Index. So how does transportation opportunity or housing opportunity or school or education opportunity, how does that impact these different health outcomes or these different OUD outcomes? Um, if you're um, a data geek and a stats geek like me, um, this is um, some more specifics on the kinds of models we ran. Um, what I will show you is incidence rate ratios and 95% confidence intervals, basically. They're credible intervals um, when you use Bayesian uh, models, but basically a 95% confidence interval. Um, to show you sort of 
what the impact of each of these area level factors is on the area rate um, of the outcomes we're looking at. So those are the methods. And here's some of the stuff that we've done so far. So this is the overdose rate per um, thousand population by census tract. And I want giving you an example here of what rate smoothing does. So over here on the left, map A, that's the raw rate. That's just if I took the rate, I didn't do anything to it, I mapped it out by these small areas. And you can see it's um, it's a little blotchy um, because there's, you know, especially in these rural areas out here, you'll see really high rates that are just related to a small denominator, right? There's just not a lot of population out there. When we smooth the rate, we see a bit more of a pattern. Um, you can see that you get rid of some of those um, extreme values when you smooth rates. And, um, and really we see kind of um, higher rates that run in this band this way. Um, and then down here in, um, you know, Syeda County and, and Lawrence County um, in our Southern Appalachian region. So clearly there are some spatial inequalities in terms of overdose. Um, in particular, it's kind of interesting to note the suburban effect around Cincinnati, which I always find kind of um, fascinating to look at. Um, and then actually there's this little sliver in here in Franklinton and, and Columbus um, that you can see as well. This is actually the results of one of the, the regression models. So what we've done here is we've modeled opioid use disorder or yeah, OUD overdoses, right? So how many, um, the rate of overdoses in a particular census tract. And we've looked at it in terms of each of the domains of the opportunity index and a few other structural components of the community that we were interested in looking at. So, you know, the take home is that if you have a um, higher educational opportunity and employment opportunity and housing opportunity, you see a, a decline or a decrease in the relative risk of an opioid use disorder. So that's these right here. Um, you have a, I have a line here at one, right? And anything that falls below that basically corresponds to, you know, an increase in that particular factor would lead to a decline or a decrease in opioid use disorder uh, overdoses in a community. And um, everything up here would be the opposite. So you can see that an increase in sort of the crime in a particular region leads to an increase in um, OUD overdoses. Um, this access one puzzled us for a little while. So you see if we have an increase in access to services, um, you would see an increase in opioid use disorder. This is one of the challenges with ecological analyses. This is sort of a chicken or the egg argument. Um, it's likely that people have better access to services are, um, are, are actually being um, diagnosed with an opioid use disorder. And so we're, it's sort of a case ascertainment bias going on right there. We're actually um, uh, identifying people better in areas where we have better access to services. And so it looks like there's a um, positive relationship between the two. Not a lot else happening down here. Um, there's lower relative, um, or sorry, um, instance rate ratios with a percent non-Hispanic Black, um, but really that's, that's about the only thing in terms of these other structural components um, that we saw. So just some very clear actually impacts of, um, the, of the, OP, the opportunity index domains with this particular o OUD outcome. Um, so there were two things that made me excited about this. I mean, not that that we found this, but that the Ohio Opportunity Index appears to be working in the way that we think it would in characterizing inequalities across communities. So here's another outcome we looked at um, of great interest to our Medicaid partners is maternal opioid use. So this is um, a measure that looks at women who have some form of an opioid exposure during their pregnancy. Um, and it's, it's out of birth. So this is only the Medicaid population. So keep that in mind. But it is remarkable, actually, um, the spatial patterns in this particular outcome. So this is the smooth rate map over here. Again, this is the raw rate map. It looks very peaky again. But there is a very large area of high maternal opioid use in the Southern Appalachian region. And in fact, you see kind of a band running through most of the Appalachia. Um, and this was probably one of the most alarming outcomes that we saw when we were doing this mapping. Um, because, you know, this is, this is, a, a, this category is a 110 per, per thousand births or more. Um, that's a lot, right? I mean, that's a large proportion of births down there where a mom had some form of an opioid use um, exposure. 
Um, and actually, this is an example of some of the cluster analysis we did. And um, it confirms, so basically what these do, these maps do, is they confirm spatial patterns are statistically significant. So this prior map just maps out what we think we see. These cluster maps are basically a statistical technique that's sort of confirming that the, the high rates that we see are actually uh, above normal, like higher rates than we would expect. Um, and what you see is also this is a temporal analysis. So this cluster down here that we saw in the south actually persisted through all uh, like 10 years of the study period. Um, so did this one over here in Jefferson County. So what that means is that this has been a persistent issue in these communities for at least 10 years, right? Whereas some of these other ones, so there's a, there's a cluster up here in Ashtabula County. Um, there's one right here just north of Columbus. These actually only showed up at the end of the study period. Um, you can see the timing right here. This is the last year of the study data that we had. This is the last couple of years. What this indicates is that earlier on in like 2000, um, 2005, 2006, there wasn't a cluster there. But as time went on, you see more and more or high, a higher rate of births um, with moms with, a, with an opioid use disorder um, in these regions. So it, it represents a worsening of the problem in these communities. So we have some communities where it's been worse, or it's been bad the whole time. And we have some communities where we're starting to see an intensification or it getting worse over time. And that's really what these reflect. So when we looked at maternal opioid use, we see a very similar pattern of how the social determinants, the opportunity index domains play out. So again, in communities where you have better education, employment, and housing opportunity, you see less maternal opioid use. Um, and in communities where you have high crime, you see higher rates of maternal opioid use. Um, we also see some um, right here, this opioid prescription. So this was looking at how many, um, how many uh, from the ORS database, so the Ohio RX reporting system, how many opioid prescriptions had been filled in that census tract. And this one we saw a very small but statistically significant increase in opioid prescriptions in an area also seems to correspond with an increase in maternal opioid use. So that was kind of interesting um, right there. The other ones you can see the confidence intervals are huge and they, they kind of pass over one. And so there wasn't um, a statistically significant relationship there. So the last one I want to share is naloxone administration. And these are just a sampling of some of the outcomes that we have as part of the healing community study that we can look at. So this is a measure of naloxone administration by EMS providers per 1,000 population in the state. Um, so this comes from the NEMSIS data system, a DPS, the Department of Public Safety, has most EMS agencies around the state reporting naloxone administration or reporting EMS runs. And from that, we can identify ones where naloxone was administered on the EMS call. Um, and so this is a map that sort of looks at the distribution of that in general. And I've zoomed in here. Here you, you've got Cleveland, and here we have Columbus. You can zoom in and see where those naloxone administrations have, have taken place um, in the different communities. So this is a really valuable resource um, of data for our communities that um, they are really clamoring for and they would like to be able to use. Um, and it's a very challenging data set to get access to through the Department of Public Safety. Um, so there, are, a lot of our communities are really excited to see these data in particular because um, they haven't really had the op opportunity before. Um, and one of the things that I took a look at is whether or not the Ohio Opportunity Index um, and rates of a sort of whether or not a community was rural or urban, whether or not these impacted naloxone administration. And that's partially because there's a difference between our rural urban communities in naloxone administration. There's much higher rates of naloxone administration in urban communities. There just is, partially because you have much higher coverage of EMS services and other such things. But I wanted to see if sort of opportunity as a whole um, captured some of these disparities. And so this is actually a chart. You can see estimated naloxone administration rate is on, is on the um, left-hand side and the opportunity index score is on the bottom. And what I mapped it out by is rural, small city, and urban. So our rural communities are rural, right? We, we, that's the Appalachia, that's up in the Northwest. Um, 
the urban communities are our large urban centers and small cities are places like um, some of some of the smaller cities like um, Lima or um, uh, uh, Springfield, places like that around the state. So they're smaller urban areas. And overall, what you see is that you have in, in lower opportunity communities, we have higher rates of naloxone administration. And you can see that because these are this left hand side of the graph are our lower opportunity communities, right? And across the board, right, even urban, small city and rural, this rate here is higher than the Loxone administration in the high opportunity communities over here on the right hand side. But what you'll also notice is that our urban communities have significantly higher naloxone administration rates compared to rural communities, especially in the high and in the lowest opportunity communities. So if you live in a low opportunity community in an urban area, the naloxone rate right here is significantly higher than if you live in a low opportunity community in a rural area. So there are some significant differences in naloxone administration across um, communities that have different opportunity levels. Um, and, and this is also different by urban and rural. So this is what I mean by it's really complex. This is an interaction between multiple different things in a community that create this really complicated understanding of whether or not naloxone is administered uh, by EMS agencies. So what are my key takeaways here? Um, all of our ecological modeling indicates that there are really important area level factors that impact a variety of OUD outcomes. Um, and these area level factors are theoretically modifiable, right? We could improve education opportunity. We could employ, improve employment opportunities. We could employ um, housing and, um, and transportation programs for people. And so I think this is interesting because these are modifiable factors that we could potentially have an impact on in our communities if we considered um, improving the social determinants of health part of an intervention package, right? Um, so there's definitely important aspects there. And the other thing that this makes me really believe is that the social determinants of health and understanding them and how they're different across our communities is vitally important for understanding the impact of a community-based intervention like the Healing Community Study. So that means that we need to develop a core set of social determinants indicators that will be important for us to evaluate in conjunction with evaluating the healing community study. Um, and we need to do that in a, in a rigorous way so that we can sort of compare across communities. Um, I think that the, the other thing to note is that data on the social determinants of health can assist our communities with planning and selecting their EBPs. So it may be that the data that we can show on the social determinants of health, the Ohio Opportunity Index, you know, whatever we choose to work with the communities with, could help them target populations or target geographic areas or target specific kinds of programs, like a transportation program or an education program or something like that. Um, and so we think it's important to include these social determinants as we're talking with the communities about what sorts of programs are going to work in their community to reduce opioid overdose deaths. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you all. Um, and I'm happy to take questions or chat about the Healing Community Study, although Darcy can probably answer most of those questions anyway, <laughs> um, but, uh, or, or some of the work that we've done outside of that. Awesome, thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was a great presentation. Um, definitely powerful to see the maps that depict so much of what we know, but I think seeing them in the map is, is really important. I have one first question and then I wanna open it up to the, the group. So there are a lot of indices around, you know, geo, in, environmental factors influencing health, yeah. um, area deprivation index, et cetera. Why, why do we need the new Ohio <laughs> Opportunity Index and what is it that, is it, in what ways is it different or similar to those existing measures? Right, that's a great question. Why do we need another index? Um, and I think, especially since um, the CDC has the social vulnerability index out there, right? So that's the one that most people are sort of 
um, using now, defaulting to. Um, what I would say is that many of the indices are not necessarily created to look at health. So the social vulnerability index was actually, was actually created to look at environmental hazards. So what makes a community vulnerable to an environmental hazard like a tornado or a hurricane or an earthquake or something like that? Um, and so it was created with that with that in mind. And it's a, it is great for that. It definitely um, sort of identifies vulnerable communities in that respect. One of the reasons that um, the Ohio Opportunity Index is important is it was created specifically for the social determinants of health. And those are not the same things as what creates a vulnerable community in terms of hazards or something else. Um, and so it's also, because of that, it incorporated a lot of data that isn't available in the census, right? So it incorporated actual data on health opportunities in a community, actual data on um, you know, crime from crime, you know, from the DPS. And so it expands this idea of vulnerability to specifically focus on things that we know impact health from the literature. And that's what makes it unique and different in terms of most of those other things. Um, I think it's, rel it's reliance on or it's use of other data aside from just census data is a huge benefit, right? Because the census data only gets you so far, right? It doesn't tell you about the health opportunity of community. It doesn't actually tell you much about transportation. The education variables are limited to educational attainment, not to actually how schools are performing in your community, whether you have high quality educational opportunities. And so in that respect, because we could use state data, it, it's it's got, it's got more there that's about the social determinants of health. So that's why I'm a big advocate for it, personally. Okay. Um, we have a couple of other questions related. Wen, do you want to unmute and ask your question? I can unmute really quick. Let me just oh, find. I, I was able to unmute myself. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I have the power. Yes, <laughs> nice. <laughs> So, yeah, I have another um, Ohio Opportunity Index question. So I'm doing yeah. work that's looking at housing stability and perceived food environments um, and some other things. And um, it's all like it, all, it's longitudinal data, um, but everybody in the sample begins in either Cleveland or Columbus. And then um, many of them moved um, either out farther from there, but a lot were moving within um those cities or those counties and so i've used i use the area deprivation index in in that work um to kind of look at you know i'm trying to measure perceptions are changing and so part of understanding that is understanding how objective environments are changing mm -hmm. um, but the ohio opportunity index sounds really cool and i mean part of it is definitely this thing you brought up of um you know having more of a focus on assets and less on these so-called deficits that we tend to focus on yeah. um, when we talk about community work. But um, something I'm wondering is how well does it work? So it seems like it would work quite well if you're comparing, you know, you know, Appalachia to other areas of, of the state. How well does it work when you're looking within um, a much smaller space? So someone moves, like the median distance moved in the study is just 2.7 miles. So if someone moves across Cleveland, does this measure work well um, for understanding those kind of granular differences in environment? Yeah, I wish, I actually didn't, um, I took, there was a map that I had that showed the opportunity index, like looking at it, like for say Columbus or Cleveland, but um, so it is built using census tracts, which is a pretty mm -hmm. small geography, especially in urban areas, right? Census tracts tend to be, you know, yeah. no more than a couple of city blocks. So, and, and what I found, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on Cleveland, but when I look at Columbus, there, there's like sharp lines in this map. So Franklinton is one of our lower income communities um, sort of in Southern Columbus. And it sits right next to Grandview Heights, which is one of the upper income areas. Um, it's literally like you can throw a rock and the map shows a disparity between those two things, a pretty stark disparity. So I do think that it captures small area variation within communities quite well. I think it does a good job of that. Um, 
You know, the other thing that you mentioned is the longitudinal aspect. Um, and actually to date, we've created two different um, years of the opportunity index. One I think goes is sort of 20, I think it's like 2010. And the other one's closer, like, yeah, it's like 2009. And the other one is closer to like 2000, I wanna say 18, right? So we actually are, I think Medicaid is committed to sort of trying to do updates as well um, on these data so that you can not just get spatial differences, but you can get temporal changes in communities as well, which is important because we know yeah. communities aren't static. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 super cool. And then I guess I just thought of a follow up question. Yeah. So do you know of I mean, I, I feel like it probably unlikely because the Ohio Opportunity Index looked like it had so many things that went into it. But if somebody, if you're trying to compare a space outside of Ohio, do you know of comparable indices or um, maybe like other useful ones that um, are used in nearby states or anything like that? Yeah, so a couple of other states have, have done something really similar. So Virginia has done a really similar census tract level one where they've included sort of larger, um, sort of larger sets of data. I believe California has done it. Um, so there, and I wanna say Texas, but that may be wrong. So there are some other states that have definitely taken this on. It doesn't look exactly the same, of course, as the <laughs> opportunity index, but it does, it does sort of capture that. Great, <clears throat> thank you. We have another question about the index from An Kyung Lee, specifically around how did you handle variables that did not have census tract level data such as air pollution? Yeah, that's a great question. So it depends, it totally depends on the measure, but um, if we had, um, so some of our data were point level data, right? So like the, there's a, bun a bunch of school data and we actually had building level information on, on schools. So how well did a school perform in the Ohio report card, something like that. Um, air pollution is, um, you know, we, we had raster based data, right? So one of the ways that you get, you, you take the pollution data is you basically create a grid across the entire United States, which we call a raster. Um, and you have different levels of PM 2.5 or ozone or, or nitrous, you know, all sorts of different pollutants in those. So in, in those cases, we, um, we use different techniques for aggregating that, you know, either raster data or point level data to the census tract level information. So if you had six raster grids of, you know, pollution data, you would do an average of those raster grids. We did also look at maximums um, for some of those things as well as averages and, um, and tried a couple of different ways. Um, so uh, that was the way we handled all of that other data through GIS, <laughs> basically, we, we GIS'd it um, and brought it all to one level. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Another question, maybe too big for a very small amount of time left, but maybe a, a one aha about how has your COVID-19 affected the geospatial nature of disparities and health outcomes, or do you imagine it's going to have an impact? Ooh, um, so I've actually taken a look at, uh, through some work for the state, I've taken a lot of looks at the COVID data as it relates to both sort of urban rural disparities as well as some of the opportunity index stuff. So um, it is clear from at least my cursory analysis that the COVID rates were higher in lower opportunity communities. Um, and, and what I'm not quite sure of yet, and what I can't pick out is what are the other sort of confounding factors there, right? So in our urban communities, the lower, in, lower opportunity communities tend to be higher minority communities. And we know that the minority communities were disproportionately impacted by COVID in our own state, as well as across the United States. In the rural areas, I think it's probably something different. We saw much lower rates of compliance with mask wearing and compliance with social distancing orders in the rural communities where we saw high, high, um, high COVID rates. So that is to say that the social determinants don't impact all communities the same, which is why it's so important to have these small area level measures is that one aspect of a social determinant might impact a COVID rate in one community, but not in another. And, and really being able to dig down and look at small area estimates sort of allows for that. 
It's great. But there's a lot more to say around that, but I will. <laughs> you're right, short amount of time left. So we have one minute left and I, I think I will let Roberto, do you wanna unmute and ask your question? Thank you so much for, for allowing me to, to do that. And thank you, Dr. Root, for this great presentation. My work is, in my dissertation work, is around yeah. dissemination of, uh, or diffusion of innovations, and in oh, yeah. the diffusions of like farmers markets in the state of Ohio. But as yeah. I'm thinking in this idea, with this idea of like diffusions of innovations, uh, particularly with the example that you gave at the end towards mm -hmm. the use of naloxone uh, and the differences that exist between rural and urban and all that, uh, different RUCA codes in that continuum. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain a little more about how are you measuring the, the temporal changes in naloxone use as a thinking as a te technology that it's been diffused throughout the state uh, in Ohio. Yeah. And how are you capturing that, that information there and, and the mapping aspect too of it? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. So so diffusion of technology or diffusion of information is is an entire area of study right that um, is really important for understanding whether or not there are what i call spatial spillovers of different things right and so you know the naloxone data we have you know something like 10 years of it at this point and we can sort of see um you can do sort of a temporal analysis to try to look to see if they're um well, I would say a spatiotemporal analysis, which which I have, I mean, I haven't done it with the naloxone, but I've done before, where you're basically looking to see if there are different spatial patterns over time, right? That's the basis of it. You're basically trying to say, okay, I have this spatial pattern now. Does that spatial pattern change in the next time period? Does it change in the next time period? And from that, you can see diffusion effects, right? You can see if, if you've basically diffused out from a core or you've seen adoption in an, a different area. Um, you can also say we have relocation or hierarchical diffusion. So it goes from one city to another city in a different time period. Um, so I think that that's a really interesting avenue for this type of research. And I guess the question would then be, are there different social determinants in a community that might lead to that diffusion pattern in a specific way. Um, and there are, are multivariate methods to do that as well. So very complicated question. You're ha you can reach out to me if you'd like to talk more about it, but it's ultimately very doable and using space can help you really look at that diffusion pattern within like Ohio or whatnot. Awesome. Well, we are at time. I do see we have additional questions. Um, if if folks are willing to stay on, we certainly can keep this live for a little bit longer, but I wanna acknowledge everybody who does need to hop off. Um, thank you so much for being here. I think Elizabeth, you brought out this point that is central to our work in the Sweatland Center, that we have to think about the complexity envir of environment just as much as we think about complexity of individuals. And you know, if you've been to one community, you've been to one community. And if you've been to one block, you've been to one block. And so I think your data approach allows for sort of uh, people to see that complexity and then ideally using it to then design community level um, intervention strategies. So thank you so much. Um, those of you that are have additional questions, if you wanted to stay on a minute or two, um, we'd be happy to have you do that. And those of you that need to leave, have a great rest of your Tuesday. Yeah. Thank you, everybody.